Hello and welcome to the Lancaster Psychology Research Showcase series. I'm your host this evening, Jill Francie, and shortly I'm going to be introducing Professor John Taus uh, as your speaker for the evening. Um, he's going to be speaking to you about online fraud, the role of psychology in cyberspace. Um, but before I introduce John, uh, just a couple of points of housekeeping. If you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, thank you. Um, I hope we don't encounter any technical glitches, but if we do, please bear with. Um, John's going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we're going to have a 30 minute question and answer session. Um, you can ask questions uh, at any time during the talk if you just post them into the question and answer box at the side of the screen. And at the end, I'll, um, I'll share those with you and we'll answer as many questions as we can in the second half of the session. Um, and also there are subtitles available for the talk. Um, and you can get those by clicking on the CC button, but um, we actually have no control over those subtitles. So apologies in advance if necessary. <laughs> OK, so I'd like to hand you over now to, to John Taus and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jill. Uh, well, it's very nice to be here this evening and it's nice to have a chance to talk about online fraud this evening from a psychological perspective. So as you can see from this initial outline slide, what I want to do uh, to start with is to explain why uh, one might be interested in researching online fraud. And then I want to focus a little bit more as to why one might want to do that from the perspective of a psychologist. And I also want then to go on to talk about some of the ways to do research in this area, in this space, um, to, to talk about some different methodologies and approaches uh, that I hope will help set a context for describing some of the relevant research findings as well as some student perspectives. That is to talk you through one or two uh, student projects that have been done in the past few years within this space to give you an idea of the sorts of questions that they've asked and the sorts of uh, uh, potential answers that they've also been uh, coming up with. That'll allow us to get some conclusions uh, and then uh, we'll open up for, for Q&A. So the first question I had is why research online fraud? Uh, and uh, here is a screenshot of a newspaper piece from Bloomberg, from Bloomberg uh, and it's not an especially recent piece, but I think it's quite useful in emphasizing that nowadays cybercrime is a very profitable business. Uh, and these figures have changed over the years, but you can see several different types of cyber crime that we know about. Uh, fake antivirus uh, crime, uh, a stranded traveler crime where people uh, say they're stranded and ask for money to be wired to them, um, advanced fee fraud, uh, also known as uh, the 419 Nigerian scam, uh, there's also malware uh, and uh, online banking fraud. Uh, now really the point of this this slide is to show you that there are many different ways in which online fraud can happen. Also, if we look a little bit further down the article, one of the other things that we can begin to appreciate, it's not just the direct costs of what people lose when they are scammed or defrauded, but there's now a lot uh, of money invested uh, in the indirect costs. That is banks have had to put in huge amounts of money uh, as countermeasures to protect their banking service. Of course, none of us want to bank uh, with an insecure service, so they have to put in lots of effort to try and uh, shore up or secure their systems. Uh, many of us, I'm sure most of you, will have some sort of antivirus software on the computer that you're using to watch this. Uh, so there's lots of money that goes into maintaining antivirus software and trying to keep it up to date and trying to protect users. OK, lots of cleanup, um, lots of law enforcement costs, uh, all sorts of other things that are increasingly following in the train of the, uh, of the online fraud that itself generate uh, costs. Um, so cybercrime is, is big business. Um, so one of the reasons that I think we want to research it and understand it is to be able to uh, better uh, appreciate and understand this real world phenomenon. Uh, as you can see from these slides here, uh, some sorts of cybercrime, and I'm going to be focusing um, 
largely they're not entirely on uh, email phishing. And um, these happen in many different ways. On the left, uh, an article from uh, The Guardian uh, about a university that was hit by a ransomware attack a few years ago. On the right, to illustrate that even big companies like Google and Facebook uh, can be themselves duped. Uh, the example on the right all started uh, from a phishing email. Now, some of these uh, articles, uh, the Bloomberg piece are from some time ago. If we look more recently uh, at, a, at, a, at an analysis of uh, the state of ransomware, we can see that top causes of ransomware attacks are phishing emails, lack of training and weak passwords. Um, so again, we can see even, even uh, currently, um, the role of email scams and phishing is important. Again, uh, just from a couple of years ago, Internet Security Threat Report by uh, Symantec. If we look at the section on the right, the top 10 biggest cyber threats to organizations, phishing is number one. So we're not essentially, if we're looking at online fraud and if we're trying to understand phishing emails, we're not looking at a, at a niche or an unusual topic. This is, this is a big problem uh, for many organizations. It's a big problem for many people uh, who are victims or potential victims uh, of fish. So there are many reasons, as, as you can see, to study uh, online fraud. But as a psychologist, why might one be interested in it? What is it that psychology can offer? Well, one way of addressing this question is to take a quote from a security expert and insider um, who remarked a little while ago that only amateurs attack machines, professionals target people. And uh, I think uh, regardless of in detail how true that is, there's an element of truth in it that sometimes machines might be difficult to attack and breach, but people might be easier. And of course, psychology, we're in the people business. So we need to understand uh, both the um, professionals doing the targeting, but also the people who are being targeted and to understand uh, how they respond, when they respond uh, and in what circumstances they act. But we can also think a little bit more about this uh, and, and, and see a range of potential psychological issues that might be important. That is, it's not just about the rules. The rules of your uh, company, your school, your university might be you don't release your password, you don't click on an email that you don't know about. But it's one thing to have those rules. It's one thing to be able to say, I have been told about these rules. We know that not everybody follows the rules. We know that not everybody follows the rules all the time. And we can think about this from a psychological perspective in terms of uh, when people to choose, when people choose uh, or when people think about the rules that are relevant. We can also think about the problem of detecting phishing emails, uh, scam mails, uh, in terms of the fact that people vary in their concentration their focus and their deliberation. We don't always pay the same amount of attention. We don't always concentrate and reflect on all the messages we see all the time. Now, again, this is a psychological issue. This is something that psychologists know lots about. So potentially we can look to see whether this is relevant uh, and useful in the online domain. Moreover, another thing that psychologists uh, have studied for a long time is that of individual differences. The fact that maybe not everybody is the same, maybe not everybody is equally susceptible uh, to uh, fraud attacks. And if we understand individual differences, that might help us understand some of the landscape over which these real world problems um, are happening. So there are uh, uh, many of these ways that I think psychologists can, can offer help, um, advice and insight. Now, another thing that I wanted to point out as we start to think about research into cyber behavior and in particular research into email phishing is this, uh, at least from my perspective, has been very much a, a team based approach. At Lancaster, uh, we, we have a, a, a team 
uh, or a centre uh, called Security Lancaster, which focuses on security and protection services. And it manages to bring together different people who share common interests, but from different perspectives. Um, and uh, so I've been able to work with uh, Helen Jones, uh, pictured at the bottom, and uh, Nick Grace uh, to the left on this problem of email phishing. Uh, Nick works in the computer science um, school uh, and can bring a different set of skills um, and expertise to bear on some of these problems. Um, but more broadly, in some of the uh, issues around cyber behaviour, um, I've also worked with uh, people such as Aves Rashid at the top left, Bashar Nasebe uh, from uh, OU uh, and Lero in, in Ireland, um, as well as working with a PhD student, Matthew uh, Ivory on the right, and also Mark Levine, who gave one of the research showcase talks a few weeks ago. Now, we all have different skill sets. We have different perspectives. Um, and the point that I'm making is, in, in many problems, but I think in particular for cyber behaviour, we can come together in different ways to bring our different skills, to bring our different ideas to bear on a common problem. Um, we all need to know particular uh, things, we all need to uh, have our perspectives, but we can gain a lot by coming together. It is not easy to do all of this research just on your own, and I don't think that's necessarily um, the ideal way to do it. So many people contribute uh, to these issues. Uh, what I also wanted to do was point out that there are also different ways of going about doing research, going about addressing questions that we believe to be important and relevant. In particular, uh, I think uh, cyber behaviour uh, and email phishing in particular uh, show up the value of using a combination of both field research and lab studies. Why do we need field research? That is, why do we need research that is about uh, often real world incidents? Because we need to understand those real life incidents as the basis for, for thinking about the problems that we experience. Sometimes the events are very rare. They only happen to a very small number of people or they only happen on a, on a very, very occasional basis. That makes it extremely difficult to do uh, formal research in the lab. It would make it very expensive to bring lots of people into a laboratory um, environment and test them again and again and again and again until you, you get an event that you're particularly interested in. But also field research is important in avoiding artificial test conditions, which can potentially at least be an issue in the lab. However, I think we also need uh, laboratory, uh, more focus based studies. And I don't by laboratory just mean the physical environment, but a more general approach of uh, looking at these problems in a much more specific, uh, focused way. Uh, because we can often get much, much greater specificity and much greater detail from carrying out specific studies. We can ensure that we can accurately measure relevant variables. We think concentration is important. We can try and manipulate how much concentration somebody can apply to a task. It's much easier to do that in a lab environment than in field research where people are doing their job uh, or carrying out their day to day activities. And we can only rely on self reports, which may not be ideal uh, when certain things do or don't happen. Also, lab studies allow us to manipulate key aspects of risk that aren't always possible in the field. Um, so, as I say, there are different ways of doing research. One thing I don't suggest is that uh, organisations try and um, test the security of their own uh, workforce, as happened very recently, last month, in fact, when, uh, as you can see from this Guardian report, West Midlands trains at workers were subjected to a uh, an email phishing uh, simulation or exercise from management. Uh, this certainly didn't pay off. If you looked at the, uh, the news uh, reporting of this event, it was clear that this backfired. And one of the points about this is that if the people involved in doing this had looked 
at the psychological and the interdisciplinary literature, they probably have known that. Because, um, for example, you can see reports from back in 2018 uh, where um, Angela Sass, for example, was asking the question, should you fish your own employees? And in 2018, Stephen Murdoch and she had already said, no, don't do it. It doesn't do much for security, but it harms productivity. It upsets the staff and it destroys trust within an organisation. And if anybody wants to go and look at those events from last month that were reported in the, in the, in the media uh, from the West Midlands trains uh, fish, you can see that that is exactly what ended up happening. Uh, a lot of people got upset, a lot of trust was destroyed, and uh, essentially a lot of harm um, was carried out. So, of course, uh, when, when I talk about field research, we're talking about trying to do it carefully, meaningfully, and, and in a productive way. So, um, moving on to look at a more laboratory-based study, I want to talk about some work that Helen Jones led where we try to uh, identify whether there might be some psychological predictors of susceptibility to email fraud. That is, are there, are there markers or measures psychologically uh, that we can use to accurately predict whether somebody will um, miss uh, an email uh, that is fraudulent? Um, and we asked uh, a number of people to make a series of judgments about a set of emails. Some of them were legitimate emails, some of them were phishing emails. And uh, we had, a, 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 as I say, over 200 people to, uh, respond to this task. And you can see that if you just look at the descriptive performance, that people uh, make mistakes. So the number of correct responses out of 36, the average was 24. In particular, the number of phishing emails that were correctly identified as phishing uh, out of 18 was about 12. Performance is not great. Performance is really not great if we realise that in the real world it only takes one uh, missed, uh, miss, missed detection. That is only, only one email that is a phish to be thought to be legitimate that could affect that individual or the organisation for which they work. So we can see that people aren't that good at this task um, and also we can see that, that uh, not everybody is the same. In fact, if we take uh, the different messages that we had, and I've shown here in blue uh, the legitimate messages that we'd used examples of, as well as a series of phishing emails that we'd uh, accumulated over a period of time, those are shown um, in red, we can see that some of these messages as you might expect, uh, also vary in terms of whether people regard them as legitimate, giving them lower numbers, or uh, fraudulent or fish, giving them higher numbers. Um, uh, sorry, that's, I said that the wrong way around. The, the, the fish numbers are the smaller ones. And you can see that the red uh, dots uh, show on the whole, people regard phishing emails as uh, less legitimate, but some uh, are, are better uh, spoofs of real messages than others. And some phishing messages seem more legitimate than some legitimate uh, messages do. So there is overlap. Some, some messages, people do seem to be quite vulnerable uh, to misclassifying. Now, as well as asking people to uh, to, to make these judgments on emails, we also had a number of um, psychological tasks that measured constructs that we were interested in, such as people's ability to uh, inhibit certain responses or be distracted by responses. So in the top example of a congruent trial, somebody's pressing the left key because the middle arrow faces to the left, whereas in the, um, uh, in the image below, the middle uh, symbol points to the right, so they press the right hand key. But you can see that the surrounding or flanker objects uh, still uh, point in the in the other direction. And we know through a, a, a wide psychological literature that these incongruent trials can be harder than the congruent trials, but we can also get a measure of how much 
uh, distraction people experienced from the incongruent rather than the congruent trials. And uh, our question was that was whether that might be an individual difference measure that might predict people's performance on their email task. We also had a series of, of other questions. Here's a question from a task that measures uh, impulsivity uh, or reflexivity, uh, where there is an intuitive answer. Many people are inclined to say that the ball costs 10 cents, because that's the difference between the total cost and the bat. Even though that intuitive and strongly cued answer is the incorrect one. Uh, actually, the ball uh, should cost five cents, so the bat costs one dollar and five or one pound and five, and they both uh, will cost one pound or ten or one dollar ten uh, together. Uh, many people uh, go for the intuitive rather than the correct answer. So what did we find or what did Helen uh, find in this work in 2019? Well, one thing that Helen found is that standard measures of personality, these are measures that people often use uh, and, and often have thought of as, as, as things that psychologists are interested in, didn't meaningfully predict performance accuracy. Whether people were extroverts uh, or introverts uh, or high on conscientiousness wasn't really something that mattered for email performance. Measures of intuitive or reflexive thinking, people's ability to answer that bat and ball problem, did predict reliably and systematically performance. Uh, it didn't offer a huge amount of uh, prediction, but it did, it did do so systematically to some extent. Also a self-report measure of risk-taking behavior also predicted performance a bit. So what that shows was that we were able to start beginning to hone in on some psychological factors that may be relevant, as well as some psychological factors that maybe just aren't, aren't important for a task like this. But of course, one of the things that you might be thinking, one of the things that we thought about quite a bit, was whether an email legitimacy judgment task, that is presenting a series of emails and saying, do you think this one is uh, fish or an illegitimate one? Do you think this one is fish or a legitimate one? Is that really a valid measure of risk susceptibility uh, in a more everyday environment? Well, we just didn't know from that study. And that was one thing that spurred us to look at a, um, a follow up or a subsequent study in which we recruited a, a group of people to come into work in an office environment for a few hours and we gave them a number of tasks. Um, uh, administrative tasks that they were doing and as part of working in that environment they received 15 emails and of those 15 emails five of them were um, simulated phishing emails. Now one of the things about creating an environment like this a simulated office environment is that uh, we didn't ask them whether they thought something was fish or legitimate. Instead, we could see whether they actually opened the message. And you can see uh, out of the total of, of five messages, many people did open it. Did they also click on the link that was in that message? Did they reply to the message or did they delete it? And later on, did they recognize it as something uh, that they had seen during the um, office task that they'd done? So my point here is to show that now we can start to look at this problem in a different way. We can see what people actually do, not just what they rate uh, or what they judge about the task. What we can also he see here uh, is uh, two bars, the black bars and the grey bars. Uh, and in the grey bars, uh, half the participants we had were primed that there was a lot of email uh, phishing messages going around in the office environment. So essentially we gave them a clue that there might be some um, problems with the email system. Uh, and one of the things that you can see is telling people to, to look out for these email fish doesn't really help them when it comes to uh, opening the messages or clicking on it. It, it did increase uh, or seem to increase the, the number uh, at least some of them that were deleted. But I think overall it shows that priming people uh, about the problem doesn't have a big an effect as you might imagine. So that shows you some of the, the research questions that we've looked at and we, we, we've looked at, at others as well. But what I wanted to do uh, is turn to some examples of some undergraduate student 
uh, projects. And some of the research questions they've asked about cyber behaviours in their undergraduate project. To give you a flavour for the sorts of uh, research projects that some of that some of our students undertake. I'm deliberately just presenting some uh, broad information to give you a, a, some of the sense of range. Um, so uh, a project carried out a few years ago tried to understand the mechanisms underlying scam vulnerability. Uh, in particular, uh, this student ask participants to make a judgment about emails. However, uh, some individuals were uh, also given what we called an internal interference task. They had to look at the email and make some judgments about the content of the email. A third group had some external interference. They were listening uh, for some uh, key stimuli that they were uh, to respond to. Simulating somebody uh, listening to an office conversation uh, rather than necessarily focusing um, on, the, on the emails themselves. So the different sorts of distraction. Uh, and what Mia found was that there were differences in uh, judgment accuracy across the email tasks. Uh, the control task, just doing the judgment task, led to the best accuracy, uh, whereas uh, was poorest with the external interference. It was also there with internal uh, interference as well. So this student uh, showing that there might be different ways in which individuals might be distracted uh, from a from a task. And of course, that's true also in real uh, real world situations. Uh, in a different project, uh, Megan uh, has looked at uh, training for phishing awareness, in particular taking advantage of differences that we know about through the psychological literature in masked learning, that's really cramming for your exam the day before, and distributed learning. The same amount of study time, but breaking it up, say, over successive days. So you either try and learn everything in one hour the day before an exam, or over six preceding days, you study something for 10 minutes at a time. So the total amount of study time is the same. Um, and in this project, um, Megan was looking at uh, the amount that individuals learnt about uh, phishing awareness uh, through mass practice as well as distributed practice. Also looking at declarative knowledge, that is factual information uh, about, about phishing, as well as more procedural knowledge, that is knowing how to do something, uh, and also contrasted the phishing awareness training with learning about um, uh, algorithms and permutations uh, for combinations of stimuli. So there was a contrast between learning about phishing and learning about non-phishing material, where it's also possible to look at masked and distributed learning practice. Uh, and uh, what was found in this project was that uh, distributed learning is a more effective way of accumulating uh, knowledge. So it's better to learn about phishing awareness over a longer period than have a single session in which you try and acquire everything you need to know. Uh, looking at a slightly different issue than uh, email behaviour, but a related security issue of password behaviour, here's a project um, last year uh, in which Madeline wanted to know about children's password behaviour. Uh, and this is particularly interesting because many uh, research studies looking at password behaviour focus on adults for whom uh, we generally expect people to, to know what security involves, to know what a, a secure password might, might, might be uh, and might involve. But for children, we can't necessarily assume that they have the same types of understanding uh, about password behaviour. And uh, this project tried to understand children's knowledge of secure password practices, as well as the relationship between the strength of their passwords and the strength of their parents' passwords. Uh, children and parents completed a questionnaire about online behaviours, so self-reported uh, online behaviours, but also asked them to sign in uh, to the study using a unique username and password. And we were, Madeline was then able to uh, analyse which usernames and passwords uh, both the children and the 
parents used um, uh, to see how uh, secure or effective they were. Uh, both children and parents created weak passwords. Children had a limited understanding of the attributes of the secure password um, and uh, parent security behaviours uh, uh, weren't, weren't strongly related to, to those of children. So those are some examples of uh, some projects that students have done. There are others, I've just taken them as, as an example. Um, one way that we've begun to think about online fraud, and in particular email fraud, uh, is by developing what we call the risk um, model, where risk represents four different dimensions, um, psychological dimensions that can contribute to performance. Uh, resilience, influence, situation and knowledge. Resilience relates to these individual differences in ability to engage in reflective thinking, this intuitive versus thoughtful thinking style. Uh, influence, on the other hand, refers to the online content, that is the message itself, that is designed to increase believability and elicit a response. So uh, uh, where these messages have a, have a sense of urgency in them as well, designed to try increase the speed and rate of response. S stands for situation, that is the context and the situational behaviours that can impair decision making, being under time pressure um, or uh, having an external interference task, listening to a conversation somebody else is having. And knowledge, users awareness of the issues surrounding fisher, phishing and cyber behaviours. Uh, if you don't have any knowledge about phishing, then it's unlikely you're going to recognise these messages when they come. Now, all these different gears kind of can work um, uh, with each other. They can influence each other. But our, our uh, thinking is that um, they're different dimensions, different components of an overall uh, behaviour pattern. That is, we need to understand each of them. And I think some of the previous examples illustrate um, the ways in which this happened. Uh, but together, uh, they represent um, uh, a, a broad understanding of the situations in which vulnerability occurs. So I've talked to you about uh, different research studies, uh, different out, uh, uh, particular conclusions from studies, but I also wanted to say, what are our broader outcomes? What are we trying to do with this research? And I think it's important to understand where are we trying to go when we ask these questions? Well, for one thing, I think we're trying to describe the real world risks. Cybercrime is big business, as I said at the start, but we also know it's rapidly changing. So I think it's important to keep uh, abreast of what real world risks are out there and what's changing. Um, and uh, our studies, I think, can contribute to that. But also they can identify the psychological variables that might be relevant to the success of these criminal or at least undesirable activities uh, that we are going to be faced with. We can also think about them in terms of what we can do to mitigate risk, that is to protect both individuals and organisations. Think back to that student project about training. What training is going to work? What's going to be long lasting uh, and effective? and what's going to be effective for individuals as well as the organisations in which they operate. So we want to help people to help themselves as well as addressing the system vulnerabilities uh, that, that may be present within organisations. OK, so let me conclude with this final slide. And I really just want to sum up, I think, the, the journey that I've taken you on. So I've said, and I hope I've convinced you, that online fraud is a major problem. It's a global problem. But also, psychologists have important contributions and insights to offer. This isn't just uh, a technical issue, but it involves people. It involves people who are on the receiving end, uh, potentially, of online fraud. And we need to understand how people handle it and the times in which they're most vulnerable. Moreover, cyber behaviour offers psychologists an opportunity to, to test and evaluate theories and hypotheses about psychological behaviours. So not only can we bring our models of behaviour and apply them 
in the in cyberspace. But we can also take those um, uh, those cyber events uh, and phenomena and match them back to the theories to see whether they can uh, they might work in different environments online and offline and so on. And hopefully I've also convinced you that online uh, fraud in, in cyberspace is a good example of where converging evidence is important. Field work, lab work, uh, looking at different ways of tackling the same question in order to get hopefully solid answers. It's also a good example of where teamwork is important, where people with different skill sets can come together to help address these problems. And also a good example of where students can get involved. They can understand uh, through the real world problems why you might be interested in this. Uh, and that can help them when they're armed with interesting psychological questions to carry out their own research projects uh, and find out novel findings themselves. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. That was really interesting. And um, we've got some really good questions that have come in as well for you as well. So just to kind of go back to that very last point that you made, made, that you made about the students, how, they, how can they get involved? Um, one, one person has asked, um, is the training learning study done with students and any idea what would happen if you train children or older adults? OK, yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, that study was done with with other students. Uh, many, not all, but many of our student projects uh, are done that way. And I think you're right. One of the key questions is how would that work in in a, um, a, 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 a professional environment. Um, now that the, the student had got the fishing materials from a, uh, a German lab that are also interested in some similar questions from a more technical uh, computer science perspective. Uh, and uh, so they're interested in also in some of these questions about uh, workplace settings. So I think it's it's um, it's a really good question. Uh, and I think there are different answers to how you might go about doing that training in ways that actually engage uh, the uh, employees uh, and help them understand the problem so that they can also become part of the organisational solution. Uh, to go back to that uh, West Midlands train example, rather than being set up to, to be seen as, as, uh, as, the, as the management trying to fool them uh, and shame them in some way. Uh, now, there was a question at the end there about working with children. Do you want to remind me of that, Jill? Uh, yeah, they, they just asked, and what would happen if you train children or older adults? Do you think you yeah. would get different results? I think it's the mass versus the distributed learning. Uh, again, I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, uh, and uh, as far as I know, we, we don't have an answer to that. I mean, I think we know that, that uh, distributed practice is better for learning on the whole than mass practice on a, on a variety of, of tasks, uh, particularly for procedural, sorry, uh, particularly for declarative uh, information. So I think we would expect it would work that way if we used, if we were investigating children's behaviour, but it's not something that I know of as having been done. Uh, and you can, I could imagine some interesting um, questions and nuances about children's development that could be studied in that context. Thank you. I'm just going to slide in a quick question of my own. <laughs> it's, it's, it's to do with what you've just been speaking about, but I was wondering when you were talking um, whether there anybody had done any research on times of day and whether it, people are more vulnerable in different age groups or have different vulnerable, vulnerable times of day. And I only ask this because of late night shopping. <laughs> my own particular knowledge, my own vulnerable times. Do you think, do you think is there any research on that? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I don't know of a lot of uh, systematic research that has been done on this. There is some, uh, there is some work that has looked at the time when phishing emails tend to be sent. And there's, there's some evidence that, that these messages sent at the end of a working week in the afternoon that's often that's often when um 
uh, IT uh, um, uh, see these things coming in. And there's a, there's a, uh, I think it's quite likely that, that people are have got less concentration, they're more tired, they're thinking about the weekend and so on. It would be very plausible to suggest that people might be uh, uh, less vigilant. Um, and uh, so I, I, I strongly suspect that is the case, but I'm not sure um, as I talk now of, of a lot of systematic work that's done that, but, but a lot of anecdotal evidence that would, would support that. OK. And um, thank you. Um, just following on from that, there's a, there's another question here, and it's also about fishing. It, it said, if, if fat priming people about fishing, i.e., warning them, has no effect, then how can we make people more resilient to phishing emails? <laughs> I, think, I think that's a great question because um, I think in, one might expect uh, a priori that priming uh, would be effective, and I, I want to be clear that. The, our finding, and indeed others uh, that are consistent with that, uh, they're not saying that priming can never work. Uh, I think there's an important distinction between uh, saying that they don't always work, or they don't, uh, or, or priming doesn't work all the time, uh, rather than it never works. So, uh, in this, this uh, study carried out by another group uh, interested in cyber behaviours, that find, finds that priming can work over some time intervals, for example, very shortly after you've been primed, you're a bit more vigilant, but then that level of vigilance can rapidly, rapidly wear off and indeed maybe fall to levels below um, those who've never been primed. So I think it's not a simple, uh, it works or it doesn't. Also, um, I think it depends what are the things that it is combined with? So within that risk framework where we have the four gears, providing knowledge can be important and, and priming will be part of knowledge that these things can happen. But knowledge has to work, has to that gear has to turn with the situation, with the influence, uh, with building up people's resilience. So I think it's really about priming on its own and the way it's done. And I think the, the point that I was trying to make is it's not enough just to tell people to follow the rules, but we need to think about how people get to understand the rules and sort of see the value in engaging in them rather than trying to bypass them. Because uh, to go again to, to the issue of, of passwords, one of the issues that um, is, is, is sometimes faced in organisations is uh, people end up using weaker passwords than they might do because the, the, the organization and the systems are creating uh, obstacles by asking them to repeatedly, for example, create new passwords every couple of weeks or something like that. Um, and so it's also about how it fits into the broader scheme of, of how people are supported in uh, positive uh, cyber security behaviors um, rather than sort of ushered into the corner where they do things that, that aren't advisable for them or for the people that they work for or with. That's really interesting. Um, it's kind of related to that, someone, that someone else has been asking. Um, if people are relying on in intuitive thinking when looking at emails, as you said in the first study, then how do you train that? And I think that goes back to what you were saying about the resilience, the four aspects of the, of the model. So yeah. it's a little bit, every bit's a, a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, one way of thinking about this, and again, just to, just to try and answer it in terms of psychological uh, approaches to studying this, uh, we, the, uh, the, t the, the test or the task of intuitive thinking has been used in many different environments uh, beyond um, the online one that I've talked about this evening. We know that there are some things that can make a difference to people's uh, reflective thinking. Um, uh, encouraging people to stop and think doesn't, doesn't uh, get people to always give the right answers to those questions, but it can increase the frequency of them. Um, so in fact, Asking, uh, encouraging people to stop and think can often be more effective than just saying don't rush uh, because it's a bit more uh, rich as a suggestion of what to do. Uh, but also, I think uh, motivating people to understand what they're doing and also what their role might be in, um, in cyber defences. So, uh, 
the extent to which people understand why they might be not only vulnerable, but why they might be attacked uh, by criminals. Uh, we, many of you, I think, will probably have seen phishing emails in some form or another, uh, and those phishing emails can come in different ways. There are the sorts that we use that go out to everybody, but then there are also spear phishing attacks where there are more carefully crafted bespoke um, attacks that are designed to get you to respond. Um, and there are uh, examples of senior uh, CEOs who've uh, had their companies compromised because they've responded to spear phishing messages uh, because the criminals know who they are, they know where they are, they know where they're traveling and they have lots of information about them and that helps them uh, craft specific phishing messages. But in order to do that, these, the, the criminals are often targeting others within the organization to get that information, to carry out what in, in computing is, 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 is sometimes known as social engineering attacks. So um, individuals in different places in a company may be targeted, not because they're being targeted, but their account might help people then get onto the backs of, of others further up the chain. Uh, and so it may be under, people's understanding of those processes may help in realizing what sort of messages they might receive and why it's important. Thank you. That's really made me think. There's, there's another question that's kind of related to this as well. And, and it's kind of like on the back of what you've just been saying. Is it, will this research inform and help fishers? <laughs> um, to, to some extent, uh, then uh, what we what we find out about uh, people's vulnerabilities uh, is something that might be um, exploitable. So there are issues about how we present the work, um, but I think that we're probably we're probably playing catch up with uh, the, some of the fishes anyway. Uh, now I'm not saying that they are psychologists particularly, but just through trial and error, I suspect they've probably got some good ideas about what they know works and what they know doesn't. And even if they don't necessarily know all of the, the, the psychological issues behind that, um, they can they can use that, they can leverage that. Of course, some things are around individual differences about the fact that some people might be more susceptible than others. Uh, that might be something of interest to us as scientists, uh, that might not be terribly relevant to the fishers who are just sending out messages en masse. They, 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 they might not mind so much um, whether some people are more susceptible than others as long as they're getting some of the responses back that allow them to pursue the, uh, the nefarious agenda that they have. Let's see. Um... I was, I was just wondering myself as well, I, because you, you talked about spear phishing earlier and there's quite a lot of new terms that are, are seem to be appearing. So I, I just myself was a, just a bit concerned whether I really understood what ransomware was because I was in an island last week and I heard that Ireland's National Health Service had been attacked and it was something to do with ransomware. Is that the actual, is that the name of the software, the, the bug that goes into the system or is, yeah. is that the nature of the attack? OK, so this can can work in different ways, but but my understanding is that a ransomware attack will be where um, for an individual computer, but much more likely an organizational network uh, where where the key files will be encrypted. So you'll no longer be able to access the information you need to do your work because it's encrypted. And then under a ransomware attack, uh, the um, the, the, the criminals who've, who've done this won't decrypt, i.e. release the files back to you unless you pay the ransom demand. Um, so uh, ransomware attacks are often about um, uh, just, just, just putting a stop on everything that you can do with your computers. Um, spear phishing uh, might be the, 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 the vehicle through which the ransomware attack happens. So it might be um, a phishing email or a targeted email to particular individuals that provides the criminals with the account information that allows them to log into the system to then put their viruses 
um, uh, or, or, or do the other, be able to just get in to look around the system to do the things that they want. Um, some of these examples of industrial espionage that involves spear phishing uh, attacks are about about getting access to the system so they can um, just just monitor what's going on within an organization. And one of the cases a few years ago of industrial espionage involves finding out about a company and a very large multinational merger uh, where they were able to find out what that company was doing, what offers it had had, you know, what the what the issues were that they could leak, that they could sell to different parties that could disrupt that merger that was designed to um, to go ahead. So in that case, just being able to get into a system just to just to spy, just to watch might be the goal. In other cases, it might be to just uh, bring the system to its knees so that they could uh, uh, impose a ransom and say uh, we're, we're, you'll never get your files back unless you pay this money. Hey, um, I think somebody else is, is asking something quite quite similar. So they're asking, can we apply what we learn from messaging around phishing or other scams to other types of public messaging, such as warning about virus spreading behaviour during a pandemic? So how broadly I think they're asking is, is the relevance of what we can learn about this sort of attack? I think that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I think there are probably degrees of generalizability. Um, one of the things that I'd be very interested to, to, to know about, and um, I think it's the sort of thing that, uh, again, would be a good uh, student project, would be to look at the relationships between, for example, email phishing and um, text frauds. Um, so the, recently there have been a lot of um, text frauds around uh, vaccine appointments uh, and uh, mail deliveries. So you get a text message to say that your parcel's been held up at the delivery company and you, you're supposed to click on a link to, to, to redirect it or, or and you don't have a parcel. That link uh, is a malicious link. Um, but th there are some, is some similarities in issues about whether people respond um, there are to those messages. There are also issues about how um, how those can be or are um, disguised uh, as legitimate messages versus how things might be presented on a screen for an email. Um, and then uh, you've got uh, we've had mass marketing scams for longer than we've had online events. So people used to get things in the post uh, that would be uh, um, very much like. Um, the advanced fee fraud that happens online, people would be told that they were about to win a prize and they just had to send in a small amount of money as a release fee. So we know that, that this doesn't, uh, doesn't always have to be online, but there are some characteristics of, of online behaviour um, that lend themselves to these, these scams. Um, and you can, we, we know that there are also some links, but also some differences with, a, with an area known as romance fraud. So uh, how people get uh, sucked into uh, believing that they are um, in a dialogue and developing a relationship uh, with somebody through a, through a dating site that is actually being used to, to set them up for, uh, for being uh, scammed um, uh, and losing money. So uh, we know there are different ways in which this, this works. There are different sort of degrees to which this will generalise. And the further out you go, I think the more likely it is that that uh, other influences, other um, aspects of, of behaviours are going to be more important. Thanks. And, and on a related note, do you think that um, having had a pandemic and people being in lockdown, what sort of influence do you think that's had on people's tolerance or intolerance of alternative ways of being contacted because I, I'm just mentioning this because my bank has got this habit at the moment of texting me <laughs> and it never used to but and, and, and I know that you know you've just mentioned that um, and I always think it's suspicious and I don't <laughs> respond to it but um, do you know do you think the ways that people are being approached have changed because of this prolonged period of yeah, I mean, we've obviously been through a series of extraordinary events in the past year. Uh, 
many people have moved online uh, doing things that, that they might not have done, or at least not to the same extent beforehand. Um, you know, during the pandemic, if banks were closed, you couldn't go to a bank to, to do some of your banking business. It needed to be uh, yeah. online um, in different ways. Um, people invariably having to do more shopping uh, and, and, and retail shopping online. So I think inevitably it leads to a change in the online activity. That also then uh, leads to uh, a series of related issues. So if you've got if you've got many more uh, accounts for different shops that you're using, um, it's also more likely that people will be vulnerable in terms of password leakage. We know that uh, a, a proportion of people use the same password on multiple occasions. So it only takes one weak link in that system. People only need to find your password for one of these things, and it means that they're likely to be able to break into to other systems through it. And of course, uh, there are increasing countermeasures to these. Um, so uh, banks uh, or other services might require what's known as two-factor authentication, uh, whereby you have to you get a message sent to your mobile phone number, and you then need to put that into the computer. The idea is that um, with that, uh, this this would be much harder for a criminal to crack unless they also have your phone. If, if even if they've managed to to guess your password, uh, that's not going to help them if they need to, your mobile phone and your mobile phone to be to be available to them at that time for that time limited message. So we've got we've got a series of countermeasures and systems that are trying to preserve at security and, 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 and keep us safe at the same time that people are constantly trying to exploit the systems that we're all using. And uh, in an area where we've, or at a time when we've, we've uh, gone through uh, a, a, a pandemic, uh, people are having to work in the very different environments, uh, people are under a lot of, of, of stress from just the, um, the environment in which uh, where we're, we found ourselves, as well as all the changes that have had to happen because of that, working from home, for example, um, I think it's it's inevitable that all those changes can can affect how resilient we are um, and uh, how how vigilant we might be um, at various points along the way. That's that's really interesting. And um, so, do you think that? Um, during the pandemic there has been an increase or does anybody has anybody got any evidence of an increase in phishing or digital scams during the, the lockdown periods? So uh, earlier yeah. on in the talk I, I gave a couple of examples of um, industry analyses of for example the main uh, types of cyber threats and the sort of information that people are acquiring. Now those um, there are there are many different types of those broad landscapes of threats and those get updated. Um, so I think there might be information out there. Often this is these these um, these things are, are, are about working on data from the year before. So I suspect we don't have much 2021 data, but they'll be analyzing the 2020 data as we speak. Um, so I think that is coming out, but I, I don't know the details of what's changed. OK. That's that's really interesting. Just one final one final question then. So if I if I was a student with a particular burning question, what would be the best way for me to go about answering that? Having listened to your talk and realised that this is a huge area and that it, this is probably an ideal time to be looking at this. Well, you know, if you've got these questions, I think that's great. I mean, what I would do is in, is encourage you to study psychology, uh, come to Lancaster and, and and learn more about psychology and what. What we will do at Lancaster is uh, help you learn the foundations of uh, psychological ideas, in particular in the first couple of years of your study, taking you through a series of, of steps um, to build up your knowledge and to build up the concepts and the, and the rigour around which you do things, so that the examples that I gave were from third year students who are then drawing on those skills, building on them uh, to look at a particular research question. And I gave some examples. Uh, other students have done other related projects. Other students have done projects in, in entirely different 
areas. But um, uh, students uh, work with a supervisor to define interesting questions and identify good effective ways of trying to address them um, so they can carry out what's hopefully for them going to be an interesting and exciting project. OK, so thank you very much, John. That was really interesting and, and I think we've got some really good questions. Um, certainly did. So thank you for all those questions. That was, yes, thank you very much for everybody. And just to let everybody know that next week uh, we've got Dr Francesca Citron talking about emotion, language and aesthetic perception, the impact of a powerful read. And if you want to watch this video or watch this seminar again, it's available. Um, well, you can look at the research, this the showcase series on the website um, and just wish you all a very nice evening. And thank you again, John. That was really, really lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Jill, and thank you to the audience.